we had a secret panel of many, many judges out looking at your posters. They may have talked to, you probably didn't know who they were. And uh, at any rate, we've come up with prizes for the top posters presented. And, uh, and these are poster prizes sponsored by SPIE. So recognizing outstanding work. Uh, now I wanna make the point, we make it every single year, and it, it absolutely is true. It's a very difficult task because there are so many good posters. It's just impossible practically, but we did converge on a set of winners. And to do the honors of uh, presenting the award, I'd like to invite uh, Katharina Sponberg, uh, past president of SPIE, to come up and make the presentations and say a few words. Thank you, Thank you so much. It's, it's always for me a great, great pleasure to uh, see all of you. And this year I know that you have been very eager students, you have been attending everything, and you have fulfilled all the prerequisites for being very good students according to what we have heard here. I so much appreciate the possibility to be here, but I even more would like to point out the possibility for you to be here and uh, to build this network. I am quite sure that during all your time as scientists, researchers, teachers, or whatever you will end up, you will remember the time you had here at ICTP. And I am sure that the network that you have been building up here will remain all your professional life. Wherever I go teaching students, meeting young people, I announce the possibility to go to ICTP and to look into the website, try to apply, and if you are successful, as you have all been here, you are accepted for this uh, workshop. The good thing is also that the learned societies, they appreciate you so much. I represent SPIE. As you heard, my name is Katharina Swanberg. I was a president of this learned society uh, during uh, 2011 and was in the presidential chain a lot of years. And uh, that's the reason why I now have the opportunity to be here. SPIE, as I said, is one of the learned societies supporting this school. And with the support also comes some interesting awards. So in my hand here, I have not less than six awards to the very, very brilliant students. And even if you don't get an award, I'm quite sure that your poster was very good because you are all good. When accepted here, you are judged very good. So, um, but, but not all of us can win the, the, the lottery. So, so that, that's the reason why I only have six, but that's a lot of, of awards and I am very, very happy to distribute them. And um, I will go through this in the, rever the reverse order. So I will start from uh, the third prize. And when I ask people to come here, you, you come up to me and then they want to make a photo. So you stay here and we congratulate each other and I give you some certificate and also some uh, more substantial <laughs> thing which I have here in an envelope. So for the first one I would like to call on the scene is uh, Maya Sundokova. So Maya, if you are here, please come. I think Maya is... Uh... <laughs> Jill asked me to help you. Should we come okay. have pictures? Yeah. Maya is uh, active in Italy, as I understand, but you originate from Russia. Your name really tells us Thank that. So congratulations. Thank you. For this. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. okay. Next person in row is uh, Pega Ascari. Congratulations, Ascari. <laughs> So now you wonder if there are only ladies, only females, <laughs> who will get the prize. I am sure not. Okay, next one. Okay, I already see him, so it's a him, and he is here. <laughs> it's uh, Mudu Mbaya. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I think we should also congratulate him because he's newly married, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he comes from Senegal, so he represents Africa. Okay, so the, the second one for second place is, um, is uh, also a, a male. So all males, listen carefully. Uh, <laughs> the name is Swamnil uh, de Gambar Mahayan. Okay. <laughs> And, and he comes all the way from India. So, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now we come to the first place. And first person I would like to call is Alexandra Falamas. <laughs> Alexandra represent Romania. is uh, Angel Sergio Cifuentes Castro. <laughs> Representing Mexico. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Katerina, and, and congratulations, winners. Congratulations, to everybody. It was really, it was really a delight to uh, go through those posters for all of us. Um, we're going to move on to another part of the program now, um, and so that's the ICO ICDP Galliano Donardo Award, uh, honoring Galliano Donardo for many years ran the optics program here at ICDP and passed away in 2007. Um, so, f to start things out, I'd like to invite uh, the director of ICDP, Professor Fernando Covedo, who you met on Monday, to come up and say a few remarks, and then he'll introduce Maria Calvo uh, for a little bit. Hey, Joe. Well, good afternoon to all of you, and it's uh, great to see this activity is moving so well, and I have heard all the good things about it, and it was good to see also a lot of already known friends uh, that uh, have been here, have been coming here for several years. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's um, 
honor for ICTP to be hosting this activity for all these years and, and to have been able to keep it running for uh, say more than 20, 24 years or so. So <clears throat> also, uh, I have to confess, I never met Professor Denardo, and, uh, but whatever I've heard from him was only good things. He, apparently everybody has such a good memories about him and all the achievements and his dedication to ICTP and his mission. And then in particular, this, this activity of the, the Winter College, the, the SOSA, and then, the, 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 then I think he deserves very much uh, a recognition and creating this prize in his honor, I think it's, it's a, one way to recognize all this, uh, the effort he dedicated to, to this field, to, to optics, and to the mission of ICTP. So, um, I think we have here several previous winners, which I think is, is very good. Uh, I can see Fred is there, Rana, and uh, uh, Murad also. Yes, Murad, yes. So it's, um, it's great that this is, uh, it's part of the community of ICDP and the, and, and the, and the Winter College, and with all, all uh, all these collaborations with uh, with uh, all the different op optics uh, societies. Uh, so um, for us, for SDP, as I said, it's, it's a great pleasure to continue doing this. And I think, uh, well, next year will be the 25th anniversary. So it's a, it will be a great occasion. So probably we can have a, something even more special. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so and I'm also very thankful to to Joe because uh, Professor Tenardo passed away, and we had to have a contact point at ICTP that can continue the tradition. And Joe has been a perfect uh, contact point, so uh, this is great that, that he continues also with us. Um, very good. So, so now let me call uh, Maria, who is the, here, <laughs> uh, who will be uh, the person introducing the winner of this uh, prize. And, and, and give us all, all the details. And uh, as you know, before I call her, I will, let me just read, this is about the ICO, ICTP, Galeno Denardo Award. It's given annually to researchers younger than 40 years of age from a developing country who have made significant contributions to the field of optics and photonics. The recipient receives a certificate of $1,000, an invitation to participate in and deliver a lecture of at an ICTP activity relevant to optics. And today, of course, he will be giving the lecture. So I will ask uh, Marisa to come and, and introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to see uh, all of you here attending this wonderful college. I think we've got quite amazing time. And I'm sure that you will go back with more load, knowledge, more network, more friendship, and I'm sure more, more motivation. This is very important. So now we are going to start with the award ceremony of the ICO ICTP Galeno de Nardo Award. And as Professor Fernando Quevedo was informing, this is a, an award that was established um, earlier in, in 2000 by the ASAN agreement between the International Commission for Optics and the ICTP. And it was by the time when Galeno de Nardo, you are seeing his picture there, uh, Professor Galeno de Nardo was responsible of the optics activities and optics pro programs at the ICTP. And allow me to tell you that he was having a great commitment for having this experiment in optics that he considered was one of the best ways for training and for students just to appreciate the importance of optics. So uh, in, it was starting in 2000, and in 2007, when we, uh, the late Professor Galeno de Nardo, we wanted to honor him and to remember his legacy, and that's the reason why this award now is having the name ICO ICTP Galeno de Nardo Award. So for the year 2017, uh, let me explain you the chair of this committee is Professor Murad Skal from University of Carthage, Tunisia. And the members of the committee are formed by Professor Anna Consortini from the University of Florence, 
uh, Professor Milcho Danailo from Eletra, Professor Johnny Emela from ICTP, and Professor Amadou Bagay from University of Chantadiop in Senegal. So I would like to thank all of you, the committee, for the work done. And luckily, we have a very, very good award this year. The award, the 2017 ICTP Galliano Denardo Award is awarded to Gautam Kumar Samantha. And the citation reads, the award recognized Samantha's significant contribution to the field of nonlinear optics, lasers, and quantum optics, as well as his efforts in popularizing science among school students in India. So uh, congratulations to Gutam Kumar Samantha. And now I shall call him to come uh, just to deliver the diploma. And John Yemela, please, or how are we going to proceed now? Excuse me. Okay, let's bring a, where, where are you? <laughs> there you are, okay. Let's bring him, give him a warm welcome. <laughs> I, think, I think besides the besides the lecture he's looking forward to, he's looking forward to a couple other things. Uh, <laughs> ah, and, and, uh, can I ask Fernando to come up and uh, Maria to represent ICO, Fernando to represent ICDP, and we take a nice picture. Um, Okay. okay, that's all. Do you want to? Uh, you can go okay, I'll chair. Okay, uh, I just got elected chair. So now we would like to ask our awardee to come up and deliver a lecture on uh, what uh, what's been keeping you very busy uh, these years, um, and also it's it's wonderful to recognize that somebody not only does outstanding research but also is very involved in outreach in the schools and is involved in the society in that way. So I think that's a very good model for all of us, uh, me included, just to get out and, and get involved, uh, trying to get that next generation coming in. So anyway, we, we always like to, to uh, reward that, uh, those kind of efforts. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank ICO, ICTP, uh, Denardo, Galileo Denardo Award Committee, chaired by Professor Maurad Jagal, uh, for selecting me for this uh, prize. I would also like to thank uh, Professor Joe Neymela uh, for inviting uh, me for this uh, conference here today and, and giving a talk on this, on my work. Special thanks to uh, the organizing uh, uh, team of ICTP, especially Federica, who made my stay and travel such a comfortable one. Even though the topic I'm just attending here, it's not exactly my research topic, but attending these uh, lectures by distinguished professors here and the experimental programs uh, basically uh, demonstrated, I really enjoyed a lot. And Hopefully, I will carry some of the experiments for my outreach activities in future. Okay, as you already know, my name is Gautam Kumar Samanta. Today, I'll talk about uh, uh, nonlinear generation and interaction of structure coherent beam radiation. I am from Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, India. Uh, this is the state. Uh, uh, this is the state in in western part of India. It's called Gujarat. And this state is uh, famous for, for uh, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the uh, father of nation. 
And Ahmedabad is the biggest city in that state. And we have this Institute Physical Research Laboratory. It's a premier institute in India, where uh, it's uh, today's India space research, uh, space research program, whatever you see, it's just sending uh, rockets to Mars or uh, sending 104 rockets at a time. It's basically started from this research institute. And here we have many research programs, basically uh, mostly the fundamental research we do. And I joined this institute in 2010 to start a new program on nonlinear optics. So, and then it took something three years for me to make a, a functional lab. This is the picture of uh, my laboratory. I named it Photonic Sciences Laboratory, uh, by inspire, inspired by my uh, PhD institute where I did my PhD, Photonics, uh, Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona. And I named that uh, Photonic Science Laboratory. And as you all know and agree, uh, success of a group basically depends upon its members. I am lucky to have a bunch of good PhD students and, and postdocs. Here uh, is Adi and his Apur. Both of them has left the group for a postdoc position abroad. But uh, some of you might have seen them uh, last year in this, in this winter college. And he got also a poster award. And some of you might also confuse me with this man who has a lot of similarity with me. <laughs> and uh, Jabir is a third year PhD student. Apur uh, Varun is second year. He is a permanent staff on Irvan. And I have a recent uh, uh, postdoc in my group, Srinivas, and an MTech student. I am also lucky to continue my collaboration with uh, my uh, former supervisor, Professor Majid Ibrahim Jade from Institute of Photonic Sciences, Barcelona, and my good friend, Chaitanya from the same institute. So I have been working on uh, some of these topics here. It's listed. Nonlinear parametric processes, optical parametric oscillators uh, in continuous wave and ultra first time uh, regime. Basically, these are the two topics what I used to do during my PhD, and I'm still continuing on that one. However, I have started new programs, uh, new projects. It's a structure beam uh, optical beams, and they are nonlinear interaction. Structure beam optical parametric oscillators, Development of bright entangled, entangled photon sources for the quantum optics experiments, and generation of hybrid entanglement and control of special structure of entangled photons. So that is important for some of the quantum optics experiments. And then I'm just starting uh, this new uh, project. It's a degeneration of terahertz and few cycle pulse structure uh, beam sources in wind infrared radiation. So I'm just having the lasers now, and I have to start uh, on this one. However, in this uh, today's talk, I'll be basically explaining some of the results we got in last three years from this laboratory. It's a structure beam optical, uh, structure optical beams, and then their nonlinear interaction, and, and the structure beam optical parametric oscillators. So before going to uh, the, the uh, research topic, I want to explain something about my extracurriculum activity, what I do, uh, and I am passionate to do that one and it was also cited in my award uh, uh, introduction. So when I was doing PhD, that time I used to think why government is spending so much money of taxpayers' money for my research what I am really passionate of. And sometimes the research what I am just doing might or might not have direct impact or, or benefit to the society. And then I thought, okay, let's, if we can just uh, enhance the quality of uh, the human resources by explaining some of the science to the society, that will perhaps you know, just justify some, of, some part of the expenses I bear. Perhaps this research will, will have longer uh, impact in longer time. That's why I was also involved in, in this outreach activity, outreach activity during my PhD uh, tenure in ICFO. That's a nice place to, to start new uh, uh, activities. And then joining a physical research laboratory I started a uh, uh, hands-on experiment for the students. So, I don't know, I have just lost the slide. Okay, so what we, we do, uh, we, we demonstrate uh, some of these basic op optics experiments, what we see in daily life, and uh, through hands-on experiments. So far we have demonstrated or developed 
50 experiments, not only concentrating on optics, but also for physics experiments. And some of the equipments also we have built that we, we carry to the students. So that exp experiments set setup will be optical tweezers. So using some of the optical components for my lab, I just build a optical tweezer where we can just trap micron sized particles and then we demonstrate to the students. And also we have uh, some other thing. So this is basically for the school children explaining uh, some of these basic optics and, and, and then when we sit in, in the interview panels for the PhD students in my institute, I see most of the brilliant students want to do theoretical research. So that's really uh, surprising. And then if you look, look back, if I look back, uh, then I see the curriculum doesn't really in India but we have that doesn't really support for the experimental research. Wow, how? So we are supposed to do some of these experiments within that uh, curriculum. And the experiments are, uh, most of the cases, the equipment will not work. There will be no professor to explain the physics behind that. And most dangerously, your senior's lab book will be available in the corner, and you can go and copy it. So to get marks, you have to complete. So you copy it and you get marks, pass, and go to the next course, next uh, semester, and then continue. So as a result of which, we don't build the affection to the, uh, to the experiment. So, so then with, uh, when we come to research, experimental research, where most of the cases there is no basic equipment you have to build, most of the cases. That means if you see the kind of research we do, in, in, in uh, during a PhD or postdoc or, or later on, and the kind of training we get during the, the college, there is a big gap. So we try to uh, make a bridge between these two gaps and to take this concept to the uh, undergraduate student. So we started a program called uh, Physics Training and Talent Search. And that started, we started in 2006. It's a, this year, uh, uh, 2000, 15 we started and 2016 also we had that one so we are just having every year in December we have a 15 days residential course where we select 50 students from uh, different colleges in India and we teach two theory courses one experimental course and I am involved in that experimental part and for the e experiment so first day we allow the students to go to the lab and lab is empty there is nothing okay and then we ask ask them some questions, one line or two line questions, like design an experiment to measure the salt, salt concentration or sugar concentration. Or does interference, some of these questions are there, there are many other questions also for, for uh, other mechanics uh, pro, uh, problems. And they are given this problem and asked to design the experiment. So initially they will go back, they will study, they will come back, propose in front of us, and then we will just verify whether it's possible or not and they have to do the experiment. And interestingly, the equipment has to be within the budget of $5. So that is uh, adding some, some uh, more difficulties and just forcing them to think about the experiment. Initially, the students will not really appreciate. They will think that I am the villain because whatever they propose, I will be just rejecting that. But at the end, they will really appreciate. And they will tell, OK, we have learned something. And without, so for the experiments, experimental research, not only you need that experiment, at the same time you use your brain to justify some of the things. So that's what we do. At the same time, we promote also uh, uh, this uh, for the career development of our PhD students. So we started last year a conference. It's a students conference on optics and photonics, where the theme of the uh, con this conference is organized by student, participated by student. So we have some uh, distinguished lecturer from abroad, sponsored by OSA, OSA, and some Indian young faculties, those who will be just uh, giving few talks, but mostly it's, uh, uh, it's by, the, by the students, given the students. So you can just see this is the picture, and my supervisor was uh, last time as a, the planary, giving a plenary talk. So in this way, we just uh, promote, and in this conference, I have very little role. I just guide and I arrange the money uh, for this entire, uh, entire process. So with this, these are the, uh, some of the activities what I do, but uh, I'll tell about the, uh, the science part what I do. 
But in my institute, I am famous for, not for the science, I am famous for the sports. Because I love very sp um, all kind of sports and I do a lot of sports. So I represent my institute also in some of these tournaments, uh, playing table tennis or tennis. I also play football. However, if I take time, then I go to the left and do some research. So that's what I'm just going to present today. So here, uh, this is a... In fact, in fact, after uh, this hour, when it was announced in my institute, then people started wondering, oh, you do also research. Then I say yes. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> this is the uh, content of my, uh, uh, my talk. I'll talk about the basics of optical vortex. Some of the lectures we have already, some of the speakers already mentioned about the optical vortices. And then generation of uh, optical vortex beams, perfect optical vortex beam and Hologosian beam. And then I'll talk about the control transfer of OM in an optical parametric oscillator. And a special kind of beam is called airy beam. And I have just uh, show you some of the results on airy beam optical parametric oscillators and then con conclude. So like Gaussian beam, most of the cases, all this nonlinear interaction we study using Gaussian beam. So the Gaussian beam is having intensity distribution, maximum at the center, and, and falls according to the Gaussian formula. And the phase will be having, you can just control that phase. It's a plane or a spherical wavefront. You can just make out of it. However, if you just change the spatial structure of that beam by some means, then that beam will have, carry a spiral phase uh, variation. So with the propagation, the phase of the uh, beam will, will uh, vary in, in spiral. So if you take a snapshot anywhere and find out its phase, then the, there will be a phase variation from 0 to 2 pi or any, uh, something else. And if you take the intensity plot of that beam, it will uh, show you a donut shape uh, intensity distribution where the no light at the center and uh, light at the outer ring. So if you have this phase variation from 0 to 2 pi, then the order is 1. It is a vortex. Are, these beams are, are, are characterized by their order or topological charge because this topology is, is being changed. And if you just have this uh, phase variation 0 to 4 pi or 0 to 6 pi, then this beam will have order 2 or, or, or 3 and so on. Interestingly, this beam is having uh, optical vortex beam carries orbital angular momentum of MH cross for photon. So once this uh, orbital angular momentum associated with this beam was invented, after that, lot of uh, very different, uh, many different fields has uh, started using this beam, like in case of trapping, twisting, and quantum optics, it's heavily used because you can just use this orbit degree of freedom, orbital angular momentum for hy hybrid entanglement and so on. In nature, also we see such kind of structures. Like if you have a whirlpool where you can see this uh, uh, water whirls uh, ac across this vortex point, it's a singular point, uh, or it's a, it's a for black hole, tornado, and galaxy also. So these are the some uh, nature, in nature you can see some of these vortices. In lab, one can generate this vortex beam through holographic technique. You make a fork pattern of this and pass this Gaussian beam through it, then that will give you a vortex beam. And that for, for confirmation, like the holography, we can just interfere this beam with a reference beam, the same beam. Then we can just see that interference pattern. Depending upon the phase of this in, uh, reference beam, we can have a fork pattern or a spiral phase pattern. Additionally, we can also generate uh, these optical vortices, taking a, a Gaussian beam and passing through a spiral phase plate. The phase plate is having thickness variation in transverse plane. So you can have the phase variation in this. And if the light passes through that one, this phase variation will be imprinted on that beam. So which will, in turn, result in an optical vortex beam like this. And uh, it's, it's a donut shaped beam. And you can have uh, different spiral phase plates. It's just a order two, four, three, four. But it's very expensive. And then technologically, you cannot really just go beyond that uh, order four or so. And <clears throat> there are only one company which can generate this one uh, for, uh, for, for higher power operation. So if you have a vortex beam of power P and order M, then the electric field is, uh, is, is presented like this one. This is a constant term. And you can see here, it's, a, it's a R to the power M. It's a Gaussian part and the spiral phase term here. So from here, if you just uh, plot that intensity, then you can see here it's r to the power 2m because r to the power 
some, some pat pat parameter is there. And as M goes, we can have that intensity pattern or dark core size of that beam increasing. So you will have an increasing uh, uh, dark core size of the vortex. So using this beam, we started generating optical vortex, vortex, vortices or perfect vortices. And these are the results we have just uh, uh, recently demonstrated. So what we have done, we have just uh, generated, uh, we have just studied the nonlinear interaction of this beam. So we have just make optical vortices of order 1, 3, 6, just for an example. Uh, these are the intensity pattern of fundamental beam at 1064, and which is confirmed through the interference as I showed previously. And then we generated a green beam at 532 and recorded that intensity pattern. You can see that intensity pattern is also in, uh, having that donut shape. So which is also con uh, confirmed through a, a new technique. It's a tilted lens technique, where if you uh, pass this beam through a tilted lens, due to the astigmatism in the lens, uh, this beam will will uh, split it into characteristic lobes. So counting the number of lobes and reducing by one, you can tell what is the order of that vortex. So if you have three number of lobes, then it will be order two. If you have 13 number of lobes, it's order uh, uh, 12. So these processes, uh, all uh, they, they uh, satisfy three conservation law. It's a, like all nonlinear processes, it's a energy conservation and momentum conservation that we know. However, in this case, we realize that orbital angular momentum conservation is also there. So the orbital angular momentum of the input beam is, is uh, equal to the orbital angular momentum of the output beam. So since it's a second harmonic generation, two photons of this is converted into a one photon, the OM of these two photons will add it up to give you a two. So like that. So we can see this is a um, orbital angular momentum conservation. However, if you just uh, measure the conversion efficiency of this beam, then you can see, we can see that conversion efficiency decreasing with the order. And if you go for higher order, then it's not really an appreciable uh, intensity useful for some of these applications or many, many of the applications. So that means with increasing order, the conversion efficiency of the beam goes down. And then why it's so? If you take the area of this beam with the order, then we see that area, area of the beam is increasing. And since nonlinear interaction is a intensity dependent phenomena, you can expect that one by a uh, decrease. Because this area is increasing linearly, so we will have this exponential decay or, or one by area decay. But orbital angular momentum is also increasing with the increase in order. So we cannot really certainly say whether this uh, decrease in this one has a orbital angular momentum has any role in the decrease in this power or not. So for that, we, we uh, generated a new kind of uh, beam. It's called perfect vortex beam. So where the size of the beam doesn't change with the OM or order. So you can see it's a normal vortices. It's an increasing order. The size is increasing. And this is a perfect vortex. So here you can see the size remains unchanged even the order is increasing, which is confirmed with this tilted lens technique. And then we uh, did this experiment. We take a fiber, uh, fiber laser and then made that vortex in the pump and made a perfect vortex through axicon and Fourier transformation at the center of the crystal and generated the green beam. So you see these uh, uh, convert, uh, beams and, and confirm their order. And when we measure the uh, conversion efficiency of these beams with order, we can see the conversion efficiency remains almost constant even the order is increasing. And a single pass conversion efficiency is 25%. It's a huge conversion efficiency for the structure beam. Normally, Gaussian beam is having highest nonlinear conversion efficiency. And this is the first report where a structure beam is showing highest uh, conversion efficiency of 25% in a single first configuration. And these are the power scaling uh, thing. So, so far, in all these experiments, I just explained Let's say you have two photons adding, and their OM is adding, because we are just having frequency uh, of conversion. So we are just adding photons, going to the lower wavelength, and OM is also added. So is it possible, let's say we make some scheme where we annihilate or subtract the OM of these beams. So this is the pictorial representation of that, uh, uh, the scheme, what I am just saying. We take an optical vortex of order L, in, uh, it's a rotating in clockwise, and we take another one in, in minus sign. It's uh, rotating in un, 
anticlockwise direction. So if you just interact these two beams in a linear crystal, then what it should be? Basically, you know, optical vertices is having a spiral winding. So if you just unwind it, then one can expect that it will be a Gaussian beam. That is a common understanding uh, people uh, maintain. Because you, you start with a Gaussian beam, imprint that spiral phase, you get a vortex. So you remove that spiral phase, you should get a vortex, a Gaussian beam. That is what I say. Uh, people say uh, some reports are there. But here we, we show that one. We see some new beam where the intensity distribution of that beam is donut shape, but it's not having orbital angular momentum associated with it. Associated with it. It's called hollow Gaussian beam, and that phase distribution of that beam is, is, is plain. So we did that ex experimentally. We started with a fiber laser again, and then frequency doubled into green. And then taking that green, we converted it into vortex of different orders using the spiral phase plates. And we took that undepleted uh, beam and made also into a vortex, and took these two beams, did, did some frequency mixing in this crystal, and generated UV radiation. As you can see, the size of these uh, this beams is having intensity distribution like this one and the size is increasing, and that is, uh, these are the experimental results, and theoretically we show that one, it's, it's matching with that experiment, the with theory is also matching. So this is the uh, interesting experiment. So all these processes, it's a frequency of conversion, we are just adding or subtracting. However, in parametric process, when you can just go for the down conversion, you can split one photon into two. So if you start with an OM, can you just split that uh, OM in, among this interacting beam? That is what we thought uh, that will be interesting. Then we will have a certain advantage on that one. So I'm just going to this uh, topic. It's a control transfer of OM or pump beam among the interacting beam in a parametric oscillator. So in case of uh, parametric process, when you have a pump photon that goes to the, uh, passes through the nonlinear crystal, due to this nonlinear interaction of that beam, that uh, converts into two photons of lower energy. Is, uh, one of them is uh, historically called signal, which is having higher wavelength, and another one is called idler. And this process is basically con uh, follows all the three conservation law. It's energy conservation, so you can just uh, split that energies in uh, anything. You can uh, adjust as long as you have this uh, conservation law. The energy of pump is equal to the energy of uh, these two photons. Then you have to also, for efficient conversion, you should have a momentum conservation. All this momentum of this beam should match so that you can just uh, transport that energy from the pump to the generated photons. And as we, we explained previously, the OM conservation, that means OM of the pump has to be equal to the OM of this, this beam. And if you put this process in a cavity, then it becomes a optical parametric oscillator. It's a single pass, and then you can just put that on say oscillator cavity, you make it the optical parametric oscillator. So now the question is, since OM cannot be divisible, so if you start with an OM in the pump beam, and try to find out, uh, uh, check that what is the OM of this generated beam. And you can see, we start with a vortex of order one, then we can have two conditions. Condition one, idler can get a Gaussian beam, no OM, and signal get a vortex beam or the idler get the vortex, signal doesn't. So these two processes are equally possible. But is there any favor, uh, favor or, or the system does, does the system favor one of these processes or they support both the processes? So for that, we did this experiment, did this experiment in an OPO. We started, uh, this, uh, this result is recently uh, accepted in Optica and it will come in the next issue. So we start with a fiber laser, frequency double into green, and took that beam, converted it into vortex, and pumped that OPO, which is, is designed in this uh, it's a two curved mirror and plane mirrors. And we uh, divided that signal and idler into two different arms so that we can individually control these two beams. And when we are having this, and then we monitor the signal and idler along with the pump. So when we have a pump beam in Gaussian intensity distribution, as you can see, which is line uh, intensity, interference pattern is also showing line, there is no uh, phase singularity. Idler and signal is also having the same intensity distribution, or, or means it's a Gaussian. However, if you take that input beam as a vortex of order one, then in that case, we get signal as a vortex, idler is Gaussian. That's very interesting. And 
and why it is happening so. That is the question it start. Why the pump is all only transferred to the idler, uh, signal, not to the idler one. So for that, we started solving the dynamical equations. Uh, these are the formulas. It's uh, nicely written in this paper. And I don't want to go into the details. Perhaps you will be bored with that. So I go to this uh, two conclusions, uh, this condition one, where pump OM is transferred to the uh, signal and idler is having a Gaussian. So in that case, we calculate the threshold condition. You get this formula. And, and do the other way. Pump transfer to the idler, signal is in Gaussian. So we, uh, we find out the tr threshold condition. So if you, this, if you compare these two conditions, you can see all the parameters are same except these parameters. These are the losses for the signal and the idler. So if the signal loss is high, then this threshold will start and vice versa. So we can conclude here, if the signal loss is more than the idler, the vortex will be transferred to the idler and signal gets that uh, Gaussian beam. If the loss for the signal is low compared to the idler, then we get that vortex transfer to the signal. So that is what theoretically we, we, we found. Then experimentally we study. So we measure the transmission of these mirrors and we found that for this red line is losses for the or transmission for the idler and this one is the signal. So as you can see here, it's clearly the loss for the signal is lower than the idler. So in that case, when we are pumping with the vortex, we see the signal is always a vortex, idler is always Gaussian. Gaussian. So that means we are just favoring the transfer always to the signal. However, if we just change the loss of this signal using an output coupler, then you can see the signal, which was the vortex, now it's giving a uh, Gaussian beam and idler is get, getting a vortex. That means you can just control the loss of the system and you can transfer selectively which of these beams can take the OM, you have that control. And, and another important thing is also, let's say you, you can see we are generating vortex beam from 960 nanometer to 1200 nanometer. It is a wide durability. No, so, no system is there that can produce over, a, uh, over such a, a long spectral range uh, with, with higher power. So basically, you know, just we are incorporating the advantages of optical parametric oscillator to generate a new structure beam, uh, uh, not new, it's just a structure beam is instead of the Gaussian beam. So normally people work with the Gaussian beam. I'm just uh, trying to do that one with the vortex. And here we, we have this, when you are pumping with one, you can have one plus zero or zero plus one, two cases. So that is what I show. What will happen if you have two? So that's the case. So two can be written two plus zero, zero plus two, one plus one. So three conditions you can just find. So in that case, when we are pumping with order two, then you can see the signal and idler, both of them are getting vertices. So both of them have optical vertices of order one. And if we just reduce the signal loss as compared to uh, idler, then we see signal is having order two and idler is, is zero. And that is not confirmed. So we couldn't really just realize the other case because these OPOs are continuous, uh, continuous wave OPOs. And those who have worked uh, in this, uh, pro, um, this worked with OPOs, they might appreciate that it's very difficult to align when you are just incorporating some losses. And for this experiment, it took more than six months for my student to, to realize. And uh, so with, if I can just uh, summarize uh, this uh, particular experiment, I can have a table like this. So I have a control parameter with me, and I can just transfer this input OM into the signal idler, generating an output state. And if I can just modulate this loss very fast, then I can get a modulation in the output states. So that is useful for OM uh, communication. So communication, in case of communication, one can use this rapid switching of OM modes. So that is. So I have just explained some of these things. In case you are interested, you can just uh, can stay tuned for this, this paper to come. So with this, uh, I'll just explain all the optical vortices. So I'll just uh, go to the last topic of, of my talk. It's an air beam optical parametric oscillators. This beam is having some fascinating features, uh, and I'll explain. So normally, when we talk about a laser beam, you can see it's a, a near field that intensity distribution is uh, 
it's a beam size is small, and then in the far field, the beam will diverge according to the divergence, divergence of the beam. However, most of us, those who are working here, they will be very happy if I have a beam like this. So the beam doesn't really diverge. So you stay there as it is. This, is, uh, this feature is called non-refraction, means beam maintaining its constant uh, size over the propagation distance. It will be also interesting if you have a feature like this, the beam bends away. So if you have an obstacle, the beam bends away and then avoid that obstacle. So it is called uh, self-acceleration or, or uh, propagation in curved trajectory. And additionally, on top of these two uh, features, if you have a, another feature, let's say you obstruct some part of the beam, but the beam reappears itself. So it heals itself, like biological cell, it heals. Heals. It's a reappearance of the structure, we call it self-healing. So if you have all these features, that will be interesting for many applications. And unfortunately, uh, the standard Gaussian beam doesn't have, doesn't, uh, do not have uh, all these uh, properties. And these features are uh, widely used. Some of these fascinating experiments, like you generate curved plasma channel, or in uh, microparticle manipulation, you can just sort, uh, depending on the size of the beam, it can be, uh, size of the particle, it can be sorted in different, uh, different ports. And also, people use uh, this kind of beam for, uh, let's say, light seed microscope. And interestingly, the self-healing property, self-healing property of the beam helps uh, to see the, uh, uh, can, uh, can look deeper into the human tissues. So that is what, uh, uh, these are the features. And this beam was uh, first demonstrated in 2007. When people saw that one, the airy beam, if you take a Fourier transform of airy beam, that gives you a, a phase variation of cubic phase variation. Okay, this is the cubic phase variation. However, these beams are infinitely extended, and in laboratory you cannot do. So for that, you have to put some exponential decay function to accommodate it in, in your uh, laboratory equipment, uh, size of that equipment. So, so, so if you have a truncation parameter, still that beam, so if A is equal to zero, it's an ideal airy beam, maintaining all the features over infinite distance. However, if you truncate that beam, with some exponential decay function, then still these beams can maintain its properties over a limited distance. So if you take that interference pattern of that beam, it looks like this, and phase profile of this beam is like this one. So typically, if you make this kind of diffraction grating of cubic phase variation, and you illuminate that with a Gaussian beam, and do the Fourier transformation, then that will give you an airy beam. It's a two-dimensional airy beam or it's just a one-dimensional airy beam. So we try to use this, uh, this airy beams because it's having interesting features. And then we try to add whether we can add all the benefits of OPO within that beam. So for that, we have just uh, uh, started uh, this. So this is the pictorial uh, uh, representation of that scheme which has earned us also a post-deadline paper in 2005, Clio post-deadline paper, and some of this recent paper in scientific reports. So uh, the, the scheme is something like this. We have a OPO, it's a continuous wave, and uh, femtosecond, anything you want. And you just uh, put a diffracting optical element. So we are just putting a diffracting optical element inside an OPO. That is really challenging until and unless you have a proper understanding about the loss mechanism inside the cavity, and especially for the continuous wave. Uh, design. So we put a, a spiral uh, cubic phase mask here, and then in the first diffracted order, we will have a cubic phase modulated Gaussian beam. And if you take that Fourier transformation of that, it will give you an airy beam. So then, once we generated that beam, we try to study whether that characteristics are feature, that characteristic features are maintained or not. So here, uh, this uh, plot is showing uh, the beam. So we, we recorded that beam intensity profile at Fourier plane with z is equal to zero. And then, then we let that beam to propagate over distance with different z values. As you can see, the beam is curving away. So if you cannot really appreciate that one, then you can perhaps see this one. So we start with the uh, airy beam and the Gaussian beam as a reference. And as you can see, the beam remains, the center of this beam remains, Gaussian beam remains unchanged, whereas it's becoming diverging because of its nature. Whereas this beam started from some point, and it's moving across uh, this point, cross-section, uh, of this X and Y plane. So the, you are just seeing that uh, propagation of that beam uh, a, along this line. So it's curving away from its uh, rectilinear propagation. 
Then we also measure its uh, line profile. So we just measure the line profile of this beam over the propagation distance. As you can see here, the size of the beam remains unchanged even you have just propagated over two meter distance. So over two meter, the beam is perfectly uh, maintaining its, its features. Then we also studied its uh, cell healing property. And uh, we just block uh, the beam, central lobe of that beam here. So we have blocked at, at the Fourier plane. And we let that beam to allow, uh, allow that beam to propagate. And as you can see here, that after 40 centimeter propagation, that beam, some of the intensities are coming here and here. And then it has a full healing. So it's, it's uh, returning. It's uh, coming back to its original shape. And uh, this below, below one is a theoretical image. It's also supported by the experimental one. So with this, I just come to the conclusion. And for the best interest of time, I will not read all these uh, conclusions. And I hope I have just convinced you that this structure beam is, we can just uh, produce from uh, nonlinear interactions and, and optical parametric oscillators. With this, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. I just turned off the microphone. Yeah, you can use this. Okay. Well, I'll use this one over here. This, is, this works. Well, thank you very much. It was a very delightful talk. I'm also glad you, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk some of the outreach things you're doing. Uh, and those are really interesting. Uh, I noticed that the director of ICTP was taking note about that $5 experiment. <laughs> hey, Joe. Oh, that's, that's really very uh, exciting. And then we are just continuing it. No, that's actually really interesting. Is this work? Oh, now it's working. Yeah, it's okay, so at the the talk, the talk is open for questions. Um, questions? While well, while they're thinking about a question, so we we oh we have a question. Ah, okay. So can you back convert the IRI beam, uh, your last no, this, slide, once to this, a Gaussian beam? No, once this beam is, uh, you know, you fabricate it, it cannot be, uh, because you just lose Could some nice, of this. No? So if you can trans so, transport no, I, I it just, like I this just, and then back convert it. I, I, no? just, I just uh, forgot to mention that one. So this beam will have uh, some shape with propagation. Since it's a truncated air beam, these features will be over a particular distance. After that, that beam will be a Gaussian beam. So in far field, so if you allow that propagating uh, over long distance, not the ideal one, so truncated one, the one we do in experiment. So in far field, there are some reports, and we also observe. So you just propagate for five meters, you will see that entire beam is collapsing to a Gaussian intensity, let's say one patch. Yeah, you can. Yes. Okay. These are non-diffracting beams. Now, is this very similar to what was called a number of years ago Bessel beams? No, this one, Bessel beam is a different one. It's a, you can just make that Bessel beam with a center one is a, with, with high intensity and then it's having rings. But this one is a, is a different one, so it's having a different structure. It's just having airy, airy, airy beam. It's just a, I think in, in uh, uh, I think Berry demonstrated that one in quantum mechanics, that airy function, and airy, airy, airy wave packets, which is having all these features. And in optics, uh, because this, uh, this uh, uh, Hamilton, uh, this, sorry, Helmholtz equation is having similarity, similarity. That's why people started uh, doing the same thing for optics. In 2007, this is the first time anybody has uh, reported for generation. Maybe I am wrong. I understood that uh, you change the, the beam uh, through a phase uh, uh, filter. No, we, we <coughs> so there are many techniques you can just imprint that phase. Yeah. Because the beam propagation is basically, you know, just you can just consider uh, that uh, these beams are interfering with each other while propagating. So that propagation. So if you just in case of Gaussian beam, all of them are having same phase, so, so they maintain their Gaussian safe distribution and then different. But if you just imprint some phase in different points of that beam, then they will no longer will be a Gaussian, so because that interference pattern will change. That is what we do, either by a holographic technique, so you just have fog pattern, so that phase variation is there in the transverse plane of the beam, or you have a spiral phase plate, which is having a thickness variation in the transverse plane, 
So different part of that beam, Gaussian beam, is seeing different phase. So they generate a new, new structure. It is a completely different structure. No, uh, by computer you can just, uh, SLM, the special light modulators are there. You can just put that phase structure in that one. But this spiral, uh, this uh, uh, special light modulators are low intensity uh, devices. So it can handle only 10 milliwatts or 20 milliwatts. I'm just talking about this nonlinear interaction where you need to handle, let's say, 40 watts, 50 watts, or, or 4 watts in that range because it's a pulse or CW. So in that case, this SLM will not work, especially. So we have to go for this spiral face plate, which has higher demonstration because it's made of uh, a glass and they cut it into different uh, shapes with the thickness variation, precise thickness variation. And there is one company in Israel who is, is expert for this one and they make, uh, and then fortunately we get that one also from them uh, to do these experiments. Another question? Okay. <clears throat> this is how I do my exercise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, when you uh, use two helical beams, Yes. with the uh, same value of the topological charge but opposite signs through the nonlinear medium, you obtain hollow Gaussian Gaussian beam. beam. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that dark core, does it remain uh, dark uh, in the near and far field or during uh, long propagation so distance? If you, if you uh, just uh, in the near field, it will be always maintaining that one. Some people say that one, it will be a Gaussian beam. But normally that beam doesn't really bring its intensity back to the center. But if you focus that beam, do the Fourier transform, just bringing that far field to uh, the focal plane, then you can see these beams, the Fourier transform of this beam will give you a Laguerre polynomial with radial index, not azimuthal index. So you will see a bright spot with circular rings. So that is uh, what we can maximum get. It means you cannot really get back to uh, the Gaussian, it will maintain its shape over, over propagation. Yeah. In fact, we have, we have another experiment where we use this uh, hollow Gaussian beam and study the frequency doubling property of that beam. And then if we allow that beam to propagate, the frequency double beam is also hollow Gaussian beam and it maintains its uh, special shape over the distance, propagation distance. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations for a Thank nice uh, talk. Uh, <clears throat> just for curiosity, you said that it took you several years to build your lab. Yes. And uh, can you give us an idea of the cost of the equipment to, to see if it can be done in other countries, in developing countries? Uh, oh. Okay. Roughly. For my, for my experimental one, uh, I was, I, I should be honest, okay. So I was very lucky uh, because this institute uh, falls under the Department of Space. So Department of Space, this Indian Space Research Organization is coming under the same. And we are also the part of that uh, Department of Space. And according to the budget we have, we have annually we project some budget. That budget is lower than the cleaning budget of, our, of all other institutes. Okay. So that's why uh, when we ask, I need this, they say, okay, please, you don't need to present, take that money and go. So, and when I, I joined, I got a huge amount of money, fortunately, and then, uh, then started. So uh, it's a, uh, I don't know how much it will be in, in, in dollars or euros, but I can tell that one in, in Indian currency, some Indian currency because it's in crores or, or uh, I think it's a, a few hundred thousand euros or more. So, so I, th I think it's a, Two three millions uh, of the uh, my 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 own experimental group is is having that kind of budget. Yeah. Any other questions? I think the advice is join a space institute. Well, don't go anywhere. I've got a couple of very important announcements. But let's thank our our award winner, Dr. Samantha, for a wonderful time. Congratulations.